In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. The epistle for the Feast of Corpus, for the external solemnity of the Feast of Corpus Christi, is that of the Blessed Apostle Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and giving thanks, broke and said, Take ye, and eat, this is my body, which shall be delivered for you. This do for the commemoration of me. In like manner also the chalice, after he had supped, saying, This chalice is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you shall drink, for the commemoration of me. For as often as you shall eat this bread, and drink this chalice, you shall show the death of the Lord until he come. Therefore, whosoever shall eat this bread, or drink of the chalice of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man prove himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of the chalice. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh judgment to himself, not discerning the body of the Lord. Being as there is a sequence, I will recite the sequence to you. Sion, to thy Savior sing, to thy shepherd and thy king. Let the air with praises ring. All thou canst proclaim with mirth, for far higher is his worth than the glory words may wing. Lo, before our eyes and living is the sacred bread, life-giving, theme of canticle and hymn. We profess this bread from heaven to the twelve by Christ was given, for our faith rests firm in him. Let us form a joyful chorus. May our lauds ascend sonorous, bursting from each loving breast. For we solemnly record how the table of the Lord with the Lamb's own gift was blessed. On this altar of the king, this new paschal offering brings an end to ancient rite. Shadows flee, the truth may stay. Oldness to the new gives way, and night's darkness to the light. What at supper Christ completed, he ordained to be repeated in his memory divine. Wherefore now, with adoration, we, the host of our salvation, consecrate from bread and wine. Words a nature's course derange, that in flesh the bread may change, and the wine in Christ's own blood. Does it pass thy comprehending? Faith, the light of law, the law of light transcending, leaps to things not understood. Here beneath these signs are hidden priceless things to sense forbidden. Signs, not things, are all we see. Flesh from bread and blood from wine. Yet in Christ, in either yet is Christ in either sign, all entire confessed to be. And whoe'er of him partakes, suffers not, nor rends, nor breaks, all entire their Lord receive. Whether one or thousand eat, all receive the self same meat, nor do less for others leave. Both the wicked and the good eat of this celestial food, but with ends how opposite. With this most substan substantial bread, unto life or death they're fed in a difference infinite. Nor a single doubt retain when, thy, when they break the host in twain, but that in each part remain what was in the whole before. For the outward sign alone may some change have undergone, while this signified stays one and the same forever. Hail thou, bread of angels broken, for us pilgrims' food and token of the promise by Christ spoken, children's meat to dogs denied, shown in Isaac's dedication, in the manna's preparation, in the paschal immolation, in old types pre-signified. Jesus, shepherd mild and meek, shield the poor, support the weak, pity all who pardon seek, and who place all trust in thee, fill them with thy charity. Source of all we have or know, 
feed and lead us here below. Grant that with thy saints above, sitting at the feast of love, we may see thee face to face. Amen. Alleluia. And the continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. At that time Jesus said to the multitudes of the Jews, My flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, the same also shall live by me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. And thus far the words of the Holy Gospel. Today we commemorate Holy Thursday for the second time. We commemorated it first on, on Corpus Christi Thursday and again today on the external solemnity of Corpus Christi. And what is it that we are commemorating? We are commemorating something so mysterious that we cannot detect it with natural eyes. We cannot see what is happening. Really what we see is an icon. You know what an icon is? An icon is an image through which you look as a window. You look at a particular template, but you see something else. You see something else that is beyond what you're physically looking at. And so you could say that this whole mass is like an icon. Now, for those of you, I know we have a lot of visitors today, and maybe we have visitors who've never been to a traditional Latin Mass. Or maybe you've been to a low Mass and you haven't been to a high Mass. Maybe you've only been to high Mass and you've never been to a low Mass. But nevertheless, it might be mysterious to wonder what all this is about. Well, we go back to Holy Thursday to find the origin of what this is all about. Now keep in mind that there are approximately 24 different liturgical rites of the Catholic Church. 24 different liturgical rites. Now what they all have in common is an apostolic origin and that from those apostolic origins the apostles went to all the ends of the known world and established all seven sacraments including the sacrament of the Eucharist and the Mass at which it is consecrated. What we find in common in all of these apostolic rites are, are the essentials of each of the sacraments. And then the ceremonies themselves differ, but the essentials are the same. Now the essential here in the Mass, in, in every rite of the Catholic Church, is the consecration and what we call the immolation of the sacramental victim. So we have, uh, or the sacri sacrificial victim. So the Mass is called the Holy Sacrifice, but it doesn't look like a sacrifice. So what are we talking about here? Well, much of this is mysterious and you don't necessarily see it. In, in, in a high Mass, every, most everything is either sung or whispered. And this goes really back to uh, our inheritance from Judaism, that sacred words are not treated like ordinary words, and so we, we chant that which is sacred or we whisper it. Some things are too, too sacred to speak out loud. You just can't speak them out loud, and so we whisper them. So the words of consecration are whispered. So what are you supposed to be doing through all that? Well, there are four ways that you, can, that you can participate in the Mass. And as you watch this ceremony, you're going to realize that, well, first of all, you probably don't understand the actual words that are being uttered. And maybe you understand or you don't the other layers of language that are not spoken. 
And the Latin Mass, the traditional Roman Rite, really works with many layers of language that are not verbal. And if you're familiar with the, with the new Mass, the ordinary form, the Novus Ordo, it is a verbal Mass. Everything is spoken. Everything is spoken. And for, for the most part, everything is seen. But in this rite of the Mass, much of it is hidden behind the priest. So the priest is like the, the icon, the iconostasis, the, the screen in, in an Eastern Rite church. You have an icon that the priest goes through and he shuts the door and you don't see anything. But you hear what's happening. You detect what is happening. If you go to the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem for the Roman Rite, the priest goes inside the, the, the tomb and you don't see anything. But you hear what's happening. And you hear the bell and you see some incense wafting out and you know what's happening, but you don't see it. So it is here. You don't see much of what, of what is happening, but it actually helps you to believe what is happening. What you don't see makes it easier to believe. So we have these various layers of language that are being spoken through the ceremony itself. Now, there are, as I said, four ways you can participate in this Mass. The first way is to follow along in your book. You can follow along and read along with the prayers. And this method would be uh, like praying the Divine Office. The Sung Mass is considered one of the hours of the traditional Divine Office. So we have Matins, Lauds, Prime, Terse, Mass, Sext, Known, Vespers, and Compline. So by praying along in the book, it is like you are fulfilling your praying of the Divine Office. You pray along in English while the priest either chants or whispers in Latin. So that's one way you can participate. And if you know the Mass well, that can be an effective way to participate. But if this is your first time at the Latin Mass, I don't recommend that. I mean, you can read along, but you're likely to get lost and frustrated. A better way to participate if you're brand new to the Latin Mass is the second way, well, I don't, I don't know if it's actually the second way, but it's another of the four ways. To just take it all in and treat it like a high-powered holy hour. If you've ever been to a holy hour in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, you might not know exactly what you're going to do for that hour. But you go in, you take some spiritual reading, maybe you take a prayer journal, uh, maybe you have some intentions you mean to pray, maybe you pray a little bit of the Divine Office, but then when you get there, the holy hour might take a completely different uh, shape than what you thought it would. Maybe you sit in silence the whole time. Maybe you're looking at your watch every five minutes, wondering how much longer you have to go. Maybe you do spiritual reading the whole time. But nevertheless, the Mass you can consider as attending a high-powered holy hour. Of course, if it's a high mass with a procession, it'll be a couple of hours. But you, then you can allow God to speak to you in the silence and through the mystery of what you don't necessarily know that is being spoken or happening. And in that way, you are free to receive what God wishes you to receive. He can speak to you in the silence of the Gregorian chant and the incense, and the bells, and the architecture, and the vestments, and the vessels, and, and all of that. Because all of those speak a language, and through all of those things, God is speaking to you. So that's a second way to participate at Mass. The third way, and I'm taking these from, from Venerable Pope Pius XII, from his encyclical Mediator Dei 1947. The third way... What is the third way? The third way is to, ah, yes. The third way is to follow along a set of meditations. So if you have an old missile like the Father Lassant's missile or some other, like the Key of Heaven or some of these other old missiles, they'll have the text of the Mass and then they'll have another section. And it'll say, during the introit, pray this. And during the priest's confidior, you pray this. And during the... Um, during the offertory, you pray this, and there are these little prayers and meditations, so that you're praying a set of meditations, 
that are not word for word what's happening at the Mass, but you're praying through what is happening at Mass through these meditations. So that's a third way. And the fourth way is to pray the Rosary. And, in, and, and particularly the, the uh, sorrowful mysteries of the Rosary. Now, some of you have probably been told, oh, you shouldn't pray the Rosary at Mass. But it, but it is appropriate, and Venerable Pius XII encouraged the praying of Rosary at Mass for this reason. Because to meditate on what is happening at Mass is the same as to meditate upon the sorrowful mysteries of the Rosary. It's the very same thing. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't get it. How is the Mass like the sorrowful mysteries of the Rosary? Well, it's because... Sorrowful mysteries of the rosary communicate the passion, the death, well, the passion and the death of the Lord. The glorious mysteries begin with the resurrection. Now, all of that happens at Mass. So to meditate upon such things, you are meditating upon the same thing that is happening at Mass. How is that? Well, on Holy Thursday, our Lord instituted the Mass and the priesthood. And how did he do that? He did that at the Last Supper. Well, the Last Supper was not so much a meal as it was a sacrifice. The Last Supper was a sacrifice at which our Lord offered himself on the cross. He shed his blood on the cross and he died sacramentally on Holy Thursday at the Last Supper. And he rose again on Holy Thursday at the Last Supper, before he ever went to the cross, before he was ever buried in the sepulcher, before he ever rose again. All of that happened sacramentally on Holy Thursday at the Last Supper. Now, how is it that that happened? Well, it happened sacramentally, not naturally. No blood was shed at the Last Supper or at least not naturally. It was shed sacramentally in anticipation. So we would call this the, the presentation of the sacramental sacrifice. And that happens at the offering of the host, which begins as bread, but by the words of consecration, it is changed into the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. As he says, this is my body. The bread is changed into his body and his blood, not just his body, but his body and his blood. Well, then he separately offers the chalice of wine. Now, when he consecrates the wine, saying, this is my blood, this is the chalice of my blood. Well, then the blood is here and the body is here, so they're separate. And that signifies sacramentally the death of the sac sacrificial victim, what we call the immolation. In the Old Testament, the immolation is the, the separation of the blood from the body of the lamb, for instance. So when the blood is here and the body is here, well, then that signifies the sacramental death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. But that's not the end, because then, later on, the priest takes a piece of the host and he breaks it, and he places it into the chalice, and he covers it. And that signifies the resurrection with the tomb closed, with the rock still, the stone still rolled in front of the tomb. That Paul represents the stone rolled in front of the sepulcher of our Lord. So he rises again when no one sees it. But when that piece of the body of Christ then takes into it the blood of Christ in the chalice, that is the resurrection. The body and the blood are reunited. So sacramentally we have the crucifixion by the consecration of the bread. His body is laid on the cross then the death by the consecration of the chalice, then the resurrection by the mingling of them two of them together again. There we have, in anticipation of the natural events, all of that happens sacramentally on Holy Thursday. We call that the presentation of the Mass. And then, 
What I'm celebrating today is the representation of Calvary in an unbloody manner, an unbloody manner. I'm representing what he presented on Holy Thursday, but what he presented on Holy Thursday was that, the crucifixion, death, and resurrection. It's a lot to wrap your mind around. Today, what we celebrate, then, is a commemoration of that first Mass, except that today we're not anticipating Good Friday, and you don't have to fast tomorrow, and you don't have to weep tomorrow. You can weep if you like. But tomorrow also is just back to normal, because today is a great celebration with a different perspective. Now we can give thanks to God and we can adore him. This is, this is a holiday of adoration. Adoration is so important in the world today because the world is a mess, and we all know that. And even the church is a mess, and we all know that. But it's only a mess in its human element. In its divine element, the church is perfect and it is strong. However weak you might think that the church is in its human element, it is strong in its divine nature. The church is perfectly one with her, bri with her bridegroom. The church, the bride of Christ, is perfectly one and cannot be separated from her bridegroom, our Lord Jesus Christ. Nor can the church be divided. The church is perfectly one. So we have to ask ourselves, am I divided from the church? There is division in that we can separate ourselves from the church. We can separate ourselves by our beliefs, by our behavior, by our sin, by our attitudes. Do you mean to be separated from the church? We need to stay one with the church and then we can live without fear. And there is fear involved in being a Christian, but it's a good fear. It's a good fear. Now, you might experience a little fear at the thought of going out in public in a procession. You might experience fear at the thought of standing outside of an abortion clinic, being at, praying the rosary and being a witness against abortion. You might experience fear in speaking up in a crowd of people that are anti-Christian or anti-Catholic. You might experience fear by making the sign of, cross, of the cross and, and praying a blessing of the food in a restaurant where people are looking on at you and snickering and whispering and uh, making uh, comments. You might experience fear in being publicly known as a Catholic and walking in a procession with all these people looking at you. That is a good fear. That is a good fear because there's power in the Eucharist. And we can sense that when it is absent from us. If you've ever gone to a concert hall for a sacred music conference or sacred music concert and thinking, oh, I'm going to go to this sacred music concert and I'm going to pray my rosary while they're singing sacred music not the same because the Blessed Sacrament's not there. You're in a concert hall. It's not the same. And you notice that absence. Just as if you go to a Protestant church where they don't believe in the Eucharist. And, and you might go into a Protestant church to pray and the Eucharist isn't there. And there's such an absence that you notice. You might recall on Good Friday when the Blessed Sacrament isn't in the church and you feel its absence. You know that there's something that's not there that you long for. Well, we need to be that presence in the world as well. Because if Christians are not in the world, then there's an absence of what needs to be there. And really what all the world longs for, even if they don't realize it. It is said that at the end of the world, I mean, there are different theories. But it is said that when the Eucharist is no longer present on this earth and when the last priest has died and Mass is not offered anymore, there will be no reason for the world to continue at that point. 
and the world would come to an end. What a desolate, dystopian thought that is. So let us rejoice that that is not the case, that we have the Mass. We once took it for granted, and then we realized how precious it was when it seemed to have been taken away from us a year and a half ago. Let us never take the Mass for granted, and let us make good use of this time that we have in our lives to adore the Lord and to surrender ourselves to Him. In nomine Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen.